Just one generation ago, gay men lived in secrecy and fear. Homosexuality was not just criminalized, it was medicalized. Oh, how times have changed. From outcasts to the smart set. We have shamed them into doing what we want. How does that happen? AIDS forced us out of the closet. To call it a sophisticated campaign is a serious understatement. The process is no different than the way that Kellogg's goes about selling cereal. I'm Anne-Marie McDonald. This Doc Zone explains how we got gay. It's hard to imagine now, but not long ago, homosexuality was something to be hidden at all costs. I now pronounce you spouses for life. Fifty years ago, homosexual acts were illegal in every province in Canada and every state in America. To be a homosexual was to live in exile from mainstream society. Society looked at homosexuals not just as a subculture who were engaging in illicit sex and possibly prostitution and that. They were also a community of people who were sick and, and deviant. I like them in the closet. We should shoot a few of these people or hang them. And for the brave few who declared their homosexuality, it was a life in the shadows. The price for being openly gay was that you were poor and you had shit jobs like being a waiter. And a lot of people devoted their entire lives to being gay and it, it, at a terrible cost. Most chose to hide. They sought to move like ghosts through the straight world, invisible to all. It was called passing. It's very difficult to remember the complete and utter invisibility of gay people at that time. Not only did people not really believe that there were gay lawyers and professionals and middle-class people and, you know, people in the suburbs, it was unfathomable. People didn't believe that gay people existed. When I worked for Time magazine in the 60s, being human, I wanted to talk somewhat about my personal life to my colleagues and friends, but it all had to be straight. So instead of talking about Bill, a six foot two blonde, I had to talk about Nancy, a five foot one blonde. And then you had to remember your lives. It was hell to live through. And you felt always so duplicitous because you couldn't really be intimate with your straight friends because you were lying to all of them. And you knew that if they discovered the terrible truth, A, you would be fired from your job, and B, you would lose all your friends. When I got out of the Navy, I went with a couple guys, and we used the same two lesbians as girlfriends, which you'd think someone would have picked up on it. I always went with Betty, and whoever I happened to be going with went with Pauline. It was always a case of showing up with someone of the other sex. I married when I was 19, right out of high school. And it was a very rocky time because deep down inside, I knew that I was gay, but I had fought it so many years and hidden so many years, I just figured I could go on through life doing that. The price of marriage was the cultivation of a secret life. I can remember being married, and Sunday night after church, I would go by this drugstore, and he had Muslim in magazines underneath the counter, and you'd have to ask to see them. That was the only magazines or anything we had to look at. I was too embarrassed to buy them, so I would make my uh, girlfriend that I was living with buy them for me. So she would go and say, I'll take uh, the Grecian Guild, please. And, they all had the alibi of being about ancient Greece or about weightlifting. For most men in the closet, sex was furtive, anonymous, and often in public places. All we could do was go out to the bars or else go to the park. We would go and park our cars and walk out into the woods and meet different people and have sex there. And then you went on with your life. That's how we lived. We lived in a closet. It 
was a dangerous life and police harassment and the risk of arrest were an ever-present threat. Getting caught meant personal ruin and humiliation. For a long, long time, the police had been involved with a process of trying to suppress, marginalize, and clean up the subcultures that they saw as illegitimate, and the police were ruthless. The major problem with homosexuals is the places of congregation to commit their sex acts in public places where they walk the streets hoping to make a pickup. They had vice work in the park. They'd go up there and cut offs as sexy as they could be, and then when you put a make on them, they'd arrest you. They'd come up sometime in a bus and arrest enough people to almost fill the bus. People had it hidden deep inside them and were very guilt-ridden about it. If you were closeted and you were married, you didn't have any place to go. Most hotels would not rent two men, and if you did, you might very well have the police bang through the door. People went into public washrooms and into parks, and that would be the first place they could kiss another man. The lack of understanding and acceptance leads to the creation of a lurid set of myths about homosexuals. The medical profession and the psychiatric profession are very much part of this story. Homosexuality was not just criminalized, it was medicalized. You grew up with a lot of shame, a lot of denial, sometimes actually listening to what you read in the medical books, which was that it, being gay was a, a disability or a, a condition. I really would pray that it would just go away. I prayed that I would just magically have a girlfriend and would wake up every day and it was still there. Many of them would undergo this behavioral reconditioning, which was you would bring pornography that turned you on, and then they would project it and then shock you or induce vomiting. It's hard to underestimate how dire things were. Most parents were doing it for the good of the child. They knew that if the son became homosexual, he was condemned to live a very difficult and unhappy life. That means that it's homosexuality, and I want to change. The parents would take their son to a physician who had been educated in a medical school where homosexuality was considered a disease. If he thought it was a serious problem, then he'd recommend treatment. You would go through a year or more of electric shock before you finally decided that you really ought to find women interesting. I went to a shrink for 20 years trying to go straight. I was engaged twice. The ideal was to have the trap door beside the bed to get rid of the evidence that you were gay so you could start off with a clean slate. Maybe today I'll go straight. But a few pioneers start to push the idea that homosexuals have nothing to be ashamed of. It's part of the spirit of the times as one minority group after another demands to be heard. In 1965, the first gay protest in North American history occurs. In order to present homosexuals as respectable and employable, Male participants are required to wear ties, preferably with a jacket, and women are told to wear skirts. In 1969, Canada moves to the foreground of the new social revolution when it decriminalizes same-sex intimacy in the privacy of one's home. There's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation, and I think that, uh, you know, what's done in private between adults uh, doesn't concern the criminal code. In the U.S., the battle over homosexual rights erupts on a June evening in 1969 at a tavern called The Stonewall. As an angry mob of drag queens, mixed race, black and young people fight back against a police raid. 
those individuals were largely on the outskirts of society. They were gender nonconformists, they were drag queens, there, there were a number of individuals that don't necessarily fit within the mainstream. There were lots of what we called A-trainers, that is people who came on the A-train from Harlem. People had nothing left to lose. These guys had been fighting the police all their lives, and now they were doing it as gays, but they had done it as oppressed minorities before anyway. I think it was in the air. We weren't gonna take it anymore. We were gonna fight back this time. With Stonewall, gays experienced the power that could come from standing up for themselves. With the new consciousness comes a new idea. The secret to happiness was to admit to being homosexual, to come out. As the 70s started happening, you actually, for the first time, started having an actual human being who would get up and actually say, I am a homosexual. A thousand gay liberationists demonstrate in New York, urging the city council to pass a homosexual rights bill. What do homosexuals do? We eat, we sleep, we watch television, that's what we do. We do what human beings do. I've never come out on anything like television and said I am a lesbian. And it's a very frightening thing to do. Word of Stonewall drifts back to Canada, where gays are increasingly feeling inspired by the battle to the South. The first gay pride march in Canada takes place on a cold, wet August morning in 1971. It's organized by an American draft dodger living in Toronto. All we want to do is love persons of the same sex and live our lives as we decide. Gay power! Yeah! A generation gap starts to emerge between the gays who came of age in an earlier time and those growing up in the 1960s. Fearing the consequences, the vast majority choose to stay in the closet. They were going around saying things like, gay is good, which was an echo of black is beautiful. The idea of having a gay magazine or a gay organization, we would say, well, we're, we're criminals. Should safe crackers have their own magazine? You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. It wasn't like Stonewall happened, then the next day everybody came out and then everything was beautiful. Everybody had their own individual journeys that they had to struggle with. There were no role models. There was no history showing the 10 people that I know who went through this. And boy, did their lives turn out great. The word on the street were the people who had been arrested and lost everything, the people who had been thrown out of the military, the people who had lost their jobs, and the fears were real. But for those who were out, the dream of having a life like other people starts to grow. With this ring, with this ring I give thee my promise. I give thee my promise. With my heart I will love thee. With my heart I will love thee. With my body I will worship thee. With my body I will worship thee. Make kiss. The continuing lack of acceptance in mainstream society meant gay life could only flourish in so-called gay ghettos. It was this definite feeling of freedom in these little protected ghettos that we created that Stonewall allowed. And instead of living a life of hookups in a park or uh, bars where you risk arrest, you could celebrate en masse with uh, large numbers of men and feel a sense of community. And to feel that freedom was, was just extraordinary. But slowly, outside the ghetto walls, a few key allies started to emerge, including the parents of some gay children. When you had anybody who was outside support you, it was really profound. So when you actually had a parent like, who actually would say good things about his or her son or daughter. Like, oh my God, like, you know, like, like, I can tell you, people would just hug them and love them. Like, partly because they knew their parent didn't react that way. But the enemies of gay freedom remain committed to keeping homosexuals in check. You started seeing a lot more visibility. At the same time, there was an uppityness of the community and the police really realize that if we don't actually do something now, this is gonna get completely out of hand. In 
In the winter of 1981, police in Toronto execute a massive crackdown on the gay bathhouses. This was the largest police operation that had happened against the lesbian gay community. And it was, in fact, the largest mass arrest in Canadian history, second only to the War Measures Act. He says, you're all being charged for being in a body house. I was flabbergasted. I still had no idea what he was talking about. The police went whole hog, decided to do it all on one night, arrest as many people as possible. Let's drag them in. Let's really teach them a lesson. You were in a room, and you started hearing commotion. You didn't know what was going on. And then a cop would come and smash the door and would drag you in and put you in. If you were naked, so be it. The people in the shower would be grabbed out of the shower room. It happened February 5th. On the morning of February 6th, we decided to actually have a demonstration that very night. had all these people contact their friends that contacted their friends and so it actually spread very very fast it really was on an order that had never been thought of a lesbian and gay demonstration which was far more angry and far more aggressive than the police ever thought they had on their hands they were completely thrown back by the reaction you could see they were not at all prepared for this angry mob. <laughs> Still couldn't believe it was in front of their eyes. Somebody said to me, police have raided the bathhouses. And I said, what if they got against cleanliness? <laughs> the police knew nothing at all about the gay male community. They actually thought there were only three or 400 gay men in Toronto, and they would all pack up and move to Vancouver as a result of the raids, but really. The bathhouse raids happened in one night, but the politics of the bathhouse raids were at least a couple of years. We had 308 men who had to go through the legal system, so we went and tracked each of those cases. We had fundraising that had to be done. Those are political, social skills that build up a community. We went through what could have taken us 20 years in two years. But within a year of the raids, a much bigger crisis has emerged on the horizon. It represents not just a threat to gay freedom, but to gay life itself. What do you think it is about the gay lifestyle that turns off uh, so many straights? Um, well, probably that we have so much style and so much fun, that we have more interesting jobs than, than they do, um, that we generally know how to live better. That's probably what it, what it is. By the late 1970s, gays were experiencing unprecedented freedom. It was actually fabulous to be gay in New York at that time. We weren't thinking of marriage, of getting rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, of getting into the Boy Scouts. Those things weren't even issues. Between 69 and 81 was the only period in human history when everybody, straight or gay, was free to do what they wanted to sexually because there was birth control, there were antibiotics, and religion was on the wane. That was a golden age of promiscuity, both for straights and gays. But in 1981, an enormous tragedy hits the gay community as a rare and deadly form of cancer shows up in 41 homosexual men in New York and San Francisco. Word of the outbreak spreads rapidly through the gay community. People didn't know what caused AIDS. They thought maybe it had something to do with sex, but maybe it had something to do with hepatitis. There are all these crazy theories. And since gay liberation was sexual liberation for us, the idea of giving up sex was just so amazing. Anyway, we were young men. I mean, we weren't going to stop having sex. We had the doctors saying, you need to stop having sex. And the sexual liberationists, which were most gay activists, were like, you don't know that. And there was doubting of the science. And it was a whole threat to what we had built up into that point, and what the gay rights movement had focused on up, up until that point, which was sexual liberation. You would see men in their 20s and 30s walking along with canes. And the pages of the BAR would have obituaries every week. It was a dark time in San Francisco history. 
Over 10,000 people in the zip code alone died from AIDS. I remember finding it easy to find rentals for an apartment because there were gay men who had died and didn't have family. This is a 1980 Christmas party, and everybody but myself has died of AIDS. Everybody seemed to have been infected before they found out, and then it was just a little too late to uh, do much of it. Through the 80s, mostly you were always taking people to hospitals or going to funerals or something. A sad time. Lots of gay men got sick, and once you were sick, you were probably out, because if you were recognizable as a person with AIDS, people were going to think you were gay, whether you were gay or not. We didn't realize, until we were forced out of the closet, how hated we were. We created all these little cocoons for each other, so we didn't have to feel that hate or know how that hate could play out. And so AIDS taught us that. AIDS taught us how much America hated us. It's hard to remember now because it was so insane and barbaric, but there were calls for quarantine, tattooing people who had HIV. As a society, we stalled and stalled and stalled, and enormous amounts of deaths took place, but also the epidemic became enormously more rooted. 70% of the country's AIDS victims are homosexual, and in cities throughout the country, gays have become increasingly alarmed. But now they are also concerned about another kind of epidemic, an epidemic of fear that is spreading faster than the disease itself. As you walk down the street, you can feel people pointing at you, you know, with saying he's one who has it. I lost my job, I lost my housing, I lost friends, I lost my own individuality. As the number of deaths climbs, the gay community becomes increasingly angry at a government that is dragging its feet and a society that seems indifferent to the crisis. As the years go by, people are just getting more and more fed up and they just want it to end. Here we were six years into the crisis. Thousands of us had been diagnosed with AIDS and thousands had died and our president hadn't even said the word. Let's stay together, let's stay united. Stop. Our mayor was ignoring it. The government wasn't spending anything on AIDS research. In 1986, a new kind of gay rights organization was born. It was a very strong movement from day one. The first meetings had over 100 people in them. That's big. We grew very fast. And from the get-go, we made national press. We're wearing all black. Our posters are tombstones. I started coming here right after the very first ACT UP demonstration, which happened right outside where I worked. I found boyfriends here. I found friends for life. And I lost a lot of people here. I remember it filled with people, sweaty, all fired up and angry and sexy and ready for bear and loving each other and loving what we were doing. You said come back in a year. Time's up, Mario. We're here. OK. We were singularly focused on HIV AIDS from 87 to 93. It's all we talked about, and it's all we used to build the gay rights movement. Alex Zuccotti. That John. Bruce Engel. As the years go by and the death toll climbs ever higher, the AIDS crisis utterly consumes the movement for gay equality. It took a while for people to move beyond the confusion and the questions to reach a point where there was this kind of collective understanding within the movement that this was a catastrophic situation. This became what defined us. It was just a nightmare. You know, it was, it was just an absolute nightmare. People didn't know what to do. Everybody was just trying to save people's lives. If you stayed quiet, if you were complacent, if you wanted to just go to cocktail parties and never discuss it because it was too painful to discuss, 
that everybody was going to end up dead. No walking out! No walking out! 80,000 dead! And AIDS also transforms the way the world sees gay men. America had never seen an angry gay community willing to go in front of the cameras, laying down in the streets, demanding to be heard, and in a sympathetic role. And even if they were uncomfortable with the idea of homosexuality, it hurt the country to know that some of its citizens were dying and that the country was doing nothing. That troubled them. The rise of ACT UP transforms the way that gay men see themselves. ACT UP really made me nervous. You know, I'm 20-something years old, I'm coming out, I'm in the middle of this AIDS epidemic, and yes, it's not good, but we're pissing off people. No more red tape! No more red tape! ACT UP shut down the Opera House on opening night, and it made headlines all over the place. Oh, you're making people angry, they can help us. And then as I got older, and especially now, I realize ACT UP saved people's lives. We've never gotten a government official to start liking homosexuals, but we have shamed them into doing what we want. Our friends were dying, our family members were dying. In order to move pharmaceutical companies and policymakers off a comfortable position, they made individuals' lives uncomfortable. You have no right to interrupt this symposium. Time. You will not learn anything no, about no. combination antiretroviral therapy. Please, there are doctors if you want in this to hear about that, 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 who don't want to be interrupted to by you. Minutes, and that's all there is to it. What may have looked a little bit like chaos on the outside, there was a strategic center that was rather brilliant. People don't see us. People don't see the, the enormity of the disease and the human cost of the disease. So strategically, what we're doing is we're making people look at us. The AIDS epidemic illustrated just how far we needed to go to right the injustices that were a part of the LGBT experience in this country. If you thought you knew what it meant to be brave, and then you watched a guy like Peter Staley, and then you say, oh, okay, now I know what it means to be brave. The whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. The world. In the crucible of AIDS, the modern gay rights movement is born. I do not think that we would have same-sex marriage if we hadn't unfortunately lost tens of thousands of people in this country and millions worldwide to AIDS. AIDS was the biggest coming out event in world history. Over the course of its history, ACT UP evolves from an activist group to a group intimately involved in drug research and testing. In 1996, its efforts pay off with the first class of drugs that start to save lives. We became this modern patient advocacy movement where you self-educate and become the experts. Can we all, before it's too late, begin to understand each other? Will we realize... We lowered the death rates by 80%, going from zero, where the government wasn't doing anything, to having a $2 billion NIH research budget, all pushing towards those treatments, and ultimately brought those drugs to 8 million people. We just completely shattered their impression of who we are as a people, what we're capable of, how we were taking care of each other, how we weren't limp-wristed and weak and quietly gonna go off into the corner and die. We found our voice, we found our power, and it was because AIDS forced us out of the closet. As of December 31st, 2000, almost half a million people had died in North America. Those who have been fighting on the front lines are exhausted. Many of the movement leaders are dead. And as the crisis ebbs and men who are sick start to get better, the leaders of the AIDS activist movement drift away. After all that 
fighting against AIDS and all the loss we had gone through and all the memorials we had attended. We just all went running for the doors and we walked away. None of the AIDS activists will play a major role in the battles to come. In their wake comes a new kind of movement with a new set of goals. Of all the legacies of the AIDS epidemic, one of the biggest was that it taught gays how to fight back. We were not going to be ushered back into a closet. So many of our friends, so many of our family members had died that we owed it to them to live life out as proud members of American society. And the experience of dealing with unresponsive governments and an indifferent society convinced the movement the next fight had to be for full equality. It left us with a sense of how daunting the work was going to be, how elected officials in particular could simply ignore us when our lives were at stake. When I think of where we are today as a strategic, smart, determined movement, it really formed a lot of the ways in which we've gone about doing anything that we've set out to do ever since. The first part is the generational question of who lived and who died. You did have, for a long period of time, 10 to 15 years, uh, nobody having hope that they could survive once they had the virus. But that built a political movement as well. You had a number of organizations created during that time who realized that this was an opportunity, that there was political strength here, and that people were ready to start using their political voice. With the dawn of a new millennium, the movement for marriage equality gains momentum in both Canada and the United States. The goal is fair and equal treatment under the law and the right to access tax benefits and spousal rights previously available only to heterosexuals. In 2003, in a landmark decision that makes headlines around the world, the Canadian government announces the right of gay people to marry is to become the law of the land. And the world's first legal gay marriage is a ceremony like no other. We were picked up that morning in an unmarked vehicle. We were driven in a circuitous route to the church. There were protesters with devil masks. They had a coffin with a knife through it saying this was the death of marriage and the death of family. We had been told by security people, the moment we sign the wedding documents, that's the time that they're going to try to prevent you from signing. And if we hear a shot, don't move, somebody will move you. Duly married in the eyes of God and in accordance with the laws of our land. As gay marriage galvanizes the movement, it garners a great deal of attention in the straight world. The religious right, hell-bent on stopping it, doubles down. I kept watching the gay marriage debate saying, that's going to be a tough one. <laughs> they don't want us to win on that one. But this time, the resources and the level of sophistication that the movement brings to the fight are unprecedented. Now, across our country, we are standing together for the right of gay and lesbian Americans to marry the person they love. The process, perhaps, is no different than the way that Kellogg's goes about selling cereal to consumers. It's based upon market research, which involves polling and focus groups, and all of that is massaged into an eventual narrative. Gay and lesbian couples should have every right to experience the joys of marriage and family that we do. Marriage is an institution of equality that pulls an awful lot of other issues with it. It is a central institution to our way of life. 
We grew up with parents. We understand that marriage is about love, commitment, and family. It's an easy way to explain what equality is like. With marriage as the standard bearer, the movement pushes for acceptance in one bastion of heterosexual power after another. Society is going to fight hardest to keep things that it wants for itself and that it doesn't want you to have. So I have spent the bulk of my career trying to get gay people into the Boy Scouts, the military, and marriage. I have never been in the Boy Scouts, I have never been in the military, I have never been married, and I have never particularly wanted to do any of those things. But if we don't have the option, then we're always going to be second-class citizens. When I first came out, I was disappointed that I wouldn't have that sort of wife and kids family. And I think it took a couple of years probably college, right about when I met Duncan, that it clicked for me that I could have a husband and kids. If you're willing to accept equality for gay people to get married, you really can't stop short of what that cultural story is. That usually evolves into a deeper commitment. The schoolyard song, first comes love, then comes marriage. What's next? Then comes the baby in the baby carriage, right? And in some cases, it's not a baby. It's an older kid, and it's foster adoption. Uh, but that's the natural progression. With the rise of the new messaging around marriage equality, mainstream attitudes toward homosexuality start to shift dramatically. We are very much part of your community. We are people of color. We are men. We are women. We are trans. We are tall. We are short. We are doctors. We are lawyers. We are your neighbors. What this rise in acceptance means is that the options for gay people have never been more plentiful. Nobody's telling them how to live their life. Nobody's telling them who they can be. Their future is theirs. They can see themselves. They know they can be who they are. When I first came out, I always assumed that if I found somebody I loved that I would be able to marry them. When the day did come that we were able to get married legally and share life with somebody of the same sex, Obviously, I was extremely happy. <laughs> Around 2003, I could see that there was progress happening and people who were gay could lead a life with a partner and have a family and not sort of have to give all that up to be gay. It's the first time where I've ever really pictured a life with someone and it's good. And with the increasing integration into heterosexual culture, some are asking, what does it even mean to be gay? My husband's bringing me a drink right now. So it's mine. In many ways, the world for gay people has never looked brighter. They've achieved a level of freedom unimaginable even 10 years ago. From pop culture to politics to big business, gays are changing the world. This is a huge leap forward in that there are images of us that are being used to bring people together. We are being represented in these ads in a way that is inclusive and is kind, is smart, and is um, an effective strategy to sell things as opposed to the years and years of our community being used as a selling tool to divide people. The only way that gay people can contribute to anything is to be out, because being gay is not a part of who we are, it's all of who we are. I think what the gay community has to teach the world is the power of not being afraid to be yourself. But can gay people have it both ways? Can they blend into mainstream society and still hang on to what makes them unique? A lot of people say that the fight for same-sex marriage is all about assimilation, where you're becoming just like straight people. To me, assimilation is just a multi-syllable word for equality. We don't want to blend in. We just want to be treated with the same respect and fairness under protection of the law. 
And that's what I think this next generation really have an opportunity to do, which is maintain the specialness of our community and also expand the area of rights and opportunities that the LGBT community has been fighting so hard for. But as the boundaries between straight and gay break down, some are left wondering what might have been lost on the road to full equality. One of the great things about being gay was my parents never said, why aren't you married? Now I have to hear this every day. Why aren't you married? Getting married and going in the armed forces were the two last things I'd ever want for myself. While I appreciate the importance of those rights for the community and I fight tirelessly for them, there's something a little banal about just wanting to be married and wanting to go kill people overseas. It's, it's what other people always did. I hope we're not raising a whole generation of 22-year-olds who are spending all their time like reading Bride magazine and planning their weddings because I think, but isn't that a sign of a certain emptiness? I don't really think that gay Stepford Wives is a great solution to this movement. Today, the gay rights movement is defined by how far it has come since the darkest days of the AIDS crisis and the change may reflect something more than just the passage of time. It's human nature. They don't see the death that propelled us into the streets in the late 80s. And people really long to get past that. They want their generation to be known for these glorious victories. The idea that there is a generation of men and women who don't have to wonder whether or not they can marry the person that they love, who don't have to worry about being able to be with the person they love when they're dying in a hospital, um, is really a tremendous, um, tremendous feeling. At some point, we will be far enough away from the struggle where we have the possibility of not remembering it. And that's one of the great responsibilities that we have to share with the younger generation. I don't want them to have to, to live through that, but I don't want them not to know. I went to my grandniece's gay wedding. They'd been going together for 12 years. And her partner's son was a preacher, and he officiated. And here I am sitting in Des Moines, Iowa, at a gay wedding. And who would have ever thought? I was actually quite proud of it, to tell you the truth. Next time on Doc Zone, deep worry from deep space. The death of 90% of humans alive, it's something that we ought to worry about. Most are working on avoiding doomsday, but many have dreams of mining fortunes. Asteroid mining is certainly an audacious goal. Mission Asteroid. After that, it's holiday programming, and then give your New Year's resolutions a fighting chance. Somebody would rather lose an arm than be in the condition that I'm in currently. If smoking was a healthy habit, I would do it nonstop. It doesn't matter how ingrained this behavior is, any habit can be changed. Slaves to habit, and who's pulling their share in your home? A sure way to a sharp pay cut is to become a mom. Motherhood systematically de-skills huge numbers of women. That it's not just a mommy issue. This is really a human rights issue. We use language like having it all. We never ask men how they have it all. Mother load. You can always screen our documentaries at cbc.ca slash doczone. I'm Anne-Marie McDonald. Thanks for watching.